Kings H Town and welcome aboard for an all new episode of HL TV Sports Show. What debate, what talk show would be good without opposing views? And here today for our latest episode, I bring in a good friend of mine, Jason Ford. If you saw us on episode one, you learned something about me. I'm an LSU fan and Texans, Rockets, Astros diehard fan. Well, Jason, conversely, is an Aggie fan, a Cowboys fan, a Rangers fan, and a Spurs fan. And I, would, I was planning to say, hey, making his worldwide debut, but Jason, you've been on TV before, Mr. Mr. Wheel of Fortune. I, I had my, my 15 minutes, uh, which was actually an hour because I was on two 30-minute episodes of Wheel of Fortune a long time ago, but uh, did well, had fun, won some money, got to meet Pat and Vanna. What else can you ask for? What else is there? If you had more than one episode, that means you won. H how'd we do? we did? We did pretty well. Uh, I think cash and prizes about 65, 66,000 altogether. Impressive. So let, let's hear about your background a little bit. I hit on your, you're an Aggie fan. I am. I'm an Aggie alum. Alum. I graduated from a and uh, back in 95. Uh, and like you said, I grew up in the Austin area. So uh, no professional sports teams in Austin. You have to kind of make a decision. Uh, I grew up following the Cowboys. I grew up following the Spurs and the Rangers. Now I've lived in Houston since 95. Uh, so I've become a fan of the Houston teams, but I think I've, I've got a pretty good perspective uh, on those other three teams. And let me tell you, it's tough. Uh, as, as you know, the Texans fans don't take too kindly to Cowboys fans. It's tough being a Cowboys fan, tough being a Rangers fan and a Spurs fan uh, in this town, but somehow I've uh, made it work. Well, the polite thing for me to say would be I won't hold that against you, but I don't know that that's true because I probably am going to hold that against you. But I think for today's show and some lively debate, I think you are just the perfect guy. Let's jump right in. Start with the Texans. We're, you know, we're around the mid-season point, and, and going into the season, there were a lot of question marks literally on both sides of the ball for the Texans. But one question that was answered for the Texans was at the quarterback play. Talk about Deshaun Watson. I mean, we all thought he would be good. A lot of us kind of knew he would be good, but talk about, you know, somewhat surprising at how good, how fast. Very surprising. You know, you, you don't see rookie quarterbacks come in and do at the NFL level what he's doing and what he did before he got injured. Uh, now this is two years in a row with Dak Prescott last year and with Deshaun Watson this year where you've seen a rookie just come in and immediately take charge. And if you think back to the rookie seasons of guys like Elway, and Manny and Brady and, and Favre and all these guys, Aikman, they all struggled. Yeah, uh, they weren't record season. setters, they that's were for not sure. Record setters. I think in the four starts that Deshaun had in the month of October, he threw 16 touchdown passes, which set a record, uh, only six interceptions, and he was a leader. I mean, not only did the, this franchise may, finally found that, that franchise quarterback, but they finally found a leader, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I think if you asked anyone up to now, J.J. Watt's been the you know, unequivocal leader of this team. He's on the defensive side of the ball. Your quarterback has to be your leader on offense, and, and Deshaun is that. And, and for him to get injured, especially the way he did, a non-contact injury in practice, uh, it's tough. I mean, you know, Houston was riding that high of a, of a World Series championship, and less than 24 hours later, they get the news that Deshaun went down. Yeah, wind out of the sails for sure. And the thing for me with Deshaun is, you know, you, you see him on, on, the, on tape in college. He, he's excelled at every level. And then you go to combine, you do these things. But for me, for him, it's his composure. The guy is cool as a cucumber, cool as the other side of the pillow, as, as, as the late Stuart Scott liked to say so eloquently. But you can't really measure that. And these, and these coaches and executives, I'm sure they sit down with them. They may go to dinner. They may try to get them on the golf course, we've heard in the past, depending on you know who the guy is. But you can't measure his composure. Yeah, it, it is. You can't measure that. How are they going to perform under pressure when they get into a game situation? Uh, the combine has so many measurables, but that doesn't tell the whole story. And to be honest, even for the greatest scouts out there in the NFL, it's a crapshoot. Right For every Deshaun Watson or Dak Prescott that you hit on, there's an Akili Smith or a, <laughs> a, a, a Tim Couch or a Ryan Leaf. Or so. so it is. It's, it, you can't measure that. And honestly, until they get thrown into battle, you just don't know. And this is a guy, and by all accounts, not just a great quarterback, but a great kid. Uh, we heard the story about what he did with his first game check, you know, giving it to some of the cafeteria workers at the Texans facility that have been affected by Hurricane Harvey. Just a great, great kid who's overcome a lot. 
And so I, I think it makes it hurt that much more to see a kid like that go down and have to deal with that injury. Absolutely. I was a little underwhelmed with his first paycheck. I don't know if you saw the amount on that. I figured there'd be a couple commas in that thing, and there weren't. That, that, that's a rookie contract. It's a rookie uh, in, contract. In, in a few years, I think he'll be ready to break the bank. One thing for me that I've never seen, and I've been obsessing, fanatical about Houston pro football teams forever, for as long as I can remember, I've never seen a team that came into the season, we knew they were going to have a dominant defense, they came off a number one rated defense last year, and we knew we were going to have this major question mark, or five question marks on the offensive side of the ball. And here, a game and a half into the season, it's a complete script flip, flip script, flip of the script, I'll get it right, and you now have the best offense in the league and a highly suspect defense. Right, and again, that's what injuries will do for you. Uh, when J.J. Watt went down, uh, that's, a, that's a huge loss. When Merciless goes down, that's a huge loss. They lost some people in the offseason in the secondary. This was an already thin secondary that got even thinner. And so now you're right. Now that you know, when Deshaun was at the controls, the question was not about the offense. We were going to score points. The question was suddenly the defense, which had been the one thing you could depend on up until this season. And I think that's, that's the beauty of, of any sport, especially in pro sports. You just never know. You come into the season thinking one thing, a few games into the season, like you said, the script gets completely flipped, and now you're talking about a, a total reverse situation. Yeah, you mentioned the Deshaun injury. Yeah, we hit on the defensive injuries, and they've been debilitating on that side of the ball. But, and despite what you hear from Coach O'Brien, the Deshaun injury is debilitating, for, for my money, to the entire team. It is. It just, you know. Well, let me, let me clarify that. Sorry. For the balance of 2017, it's debilitating. Right. It is. I mean, there was so much hope. I, I, you know, you, you touched on it, I think, in, in, the, in the first episode of the show. So much hope. And even though the record wasn't astounding, even though they weren't, you know, leading the conference, they weren't, people weren't talking Super Bowl, you, you honestly felt like Deshaun might be able to get this team to the playoffs. Uh, now I don't think there's a person on that team. That, that honestly, if you, if you pulled them aside and said, hey, you know, off the record, do you really think we can make the playoffs without Deshaun? I think to a man, they'd tell you no. Uh, now, I think the good part of that is if rehab goes well, by all accounts, this is a kid that has overcome a lot in his life already. I think he'll come back from this. I think you go into 2018 with a lot of hope. Yeah, you talk about we flipped the script a couple times. Now the defensive script is a sad story, and um, unfortunately the offensive script is also a sad story. So we'll switch gears. We're going to head up 45, talk about a team that you might have some interest or some affinity to. And has there ever been a season in the last 10 where there's not some drama surrounding America's team? Yeah, always going to be a little bit of controversy, a little bit of drama when it comes to the Cowboys. This year, uh, of course, I think it's the, the Zeke Elliott sideshow, for lack of a better word. So the latest and greatest is he is now officially suspended for the next six games pending further legal iteration. As of right now, he's suspended. Maybe that changes 24 hours from now. I think this is the third time they've said, no, you really are suspended now. Uh, the two, two times prior then, a certain circuit court of appeals then turned around and said, no, 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 not so fast, he's not suspended. I think this time it will stick. I think they have thoroughly exhausted all of their avenues, and I think the Cowboys need to adjust to life without Zeke Elliott for the next six games. So let's talk about that. What does the short term look like for the Cowboys team here in the middle of this 27 campaign without Zeke? There's still a lot of talent in that backfield. Alfred Morris is a guy who was a feature back for the Washington Redskins, put up good numbers. And when he's been in there, he's, he's run well. Uh, Rod Smith has a ton of talent. Darren McFadden is still in that backfield. So they got a lot of pieces they can kind of plug in and do a running back by committee. Let's be honest, though, the running game is all about that huge offensive line, that huge, talented offensive line. The Cowboys spent a lot of high draft picks to get those guys. For the most part, they have done their job. Uh, will they miss Ezekiel Elliott? Absolutely. You don't just replace Ezekiel Elliott. But the truth is, with Alfred Morris, with Darren McFadden, with Rod Smith, if that offensive line plays to their capabilities, any one of those guys can run for 100 yards plus and a touchdown or two behind that offensive line. So I, th I think I might be able to pick up like 60, 70 yards. Uh, I think you again. probably could. Okay, thank you. So there's always a silver lining when stuff like this happens. Tell me what your opinion is. Is that silver lining going to be the maturing of the Cowboys passing game? 
or is it going to be something else offensive? Yeah, I think it, it's going to mean that, that Dak Prescott can continue to run the offense the way he has, which is he takes what the defense gives him. Uh, he's not going to force Ezekiel Elliott if it's not working. He's not going to force the ball down the field to Des Bryant uh, if they're double and triple teaming Des Bryant. So I think that Dak Prescott is in a good situation. They're lucky to have him in there because I think he does a good job of, of working with what the defense gives him. And so again, will the, will the loss of Ezekiel Elliott hurt? Absolutely it will. You know, it, it would hurt any team. But I think the Cowboys can move on and I think they'll, they'll actually be okay from this. And I think it's gonna give that defense a chance to continue to grow. It, it, honestly, if you ask me who's maybe the most important player on that Cowboys team that they cannot lose, I don't think it's Ezekiel Elliott. It may not even be Dak Prescott. In my opinion, it's Sean Lee. That defense without Sean Lee is a shell of itself. When Sean Lee is in there, he's 8, 10, 11 tackles a game, and he almost single-handedly can stop a running game like he did against Hunt and the Kansas City Chiefs just this last week. Yeah, there's a dying breed or a lost art is a, is a linebacker slash hybrid safety that can cover some of these uber talented backs and tight ends in the open field and Sean Lee's proven when healthy to be one of the best in the league at doing that. And that's the thing, when healthy. And every time he goes down, if you're a Cowboys fan, honestly you hold your breath. If he if he if he takes a little bit longer to get up after the play, you get nervous. Uh, the Texans have one in Brian Cushing. Right? You, you when you talk about Ryan Cushing you always say the same thing. When healthy He's a difference maker. The problem is he's just never healthy. So let's, let's, let's change our point of view a little bit. We're going to go off the field. We're going to talk about the Cowboys owner and his relationship with his fellow owners and his relationship with Roger Goodell now. There's no mystery or no doubt that there's some friction over this Zeke controversy or the Zeke issue. And, and here lately we're hearing about some grumblings that some of the owners, led by Jerry Jones, may want to get rid of go. Commissioner Goodell. Well, hello. Hey. Thank you, Kelly. And hey, that's a great opportunity. I want to tell you folks about Twin Peaks. Here we are, HLTV Sports coming at you from Twin Peaks Kirby. Make sure you get out to any one of your five locations in Houston. There's 290, there's Woodlands and Shenandoah. The first one in Houston is Clear Lake and Webster, right here at Kirby and out west at I-10 in Kirkwood. They also have a location in Beaumont and Corpus Christi. And our global viewers, check them out online, Twin Peaks. There's locations all out, all throughout the U.S. So back, back to Jerry Jones and Goodell. What do we think is going to be the fallout from that? I mean, do we think that Jerry Jones is making a power play here and get rid of Goodell and maybe get his guy into, I almost said the White House, <laughs> into the into the commissionership. It, it might be a more powerful position than the White House, to be honest. Um, I think what, what we're seeing here and what, what the situation with Ezekiel Elliott has exposed, again, is, is what a train wreck the NFL can be when it comes to things like suspensions and enforcing the rules, keeping control and all that. I think there's always going to be tension between Jerry Jones and Roger Goodell. There's always going to be tension between the owner of the Patriots and, and Roger Goodell. There was always tension uh, you know, with, with the Raiders uh, and Roger Goodell, you know, the, the, high, the high visibility owners. I think Goodell wants his face to be the face of the NFL and the owners group. Uh, and the truth is there's a lot of egos and a lot of personalities, the biggest among them being Jerry Jones, Daniel Snyder over in Washington. I mean, the list goes on and on. I don't necessarily think that Jerry's looking to maybe unseat Goodell and get his guy in there, but I think what he is trying to do is to maybe expose Goodell a little bit. Uh, and and you know, I think when you if you ask the other owners' opinion of Jerry Jones, the, I think he's certainly not well liked by a lot of the owners. But I think to a man, they do respect what he's done, what he's done with the Cowboys, what he's done with that stadium. Uh, and, and what he's and I think that when you when you start to take sides, if you will, between any owner and Goodell, unfortunately for Roger Goodell, most folks are going to side with the owner. Yeah, there's always going to be a bit of a contentious relationship. Doesn't have to be, but there's it's there's so much money on the table. There's so much at stake between the owners and, and the ownership. And the one thing that it sort of reminds me of is is the Texans owner Bob McNair made those unfortunate comments about the inmates running the prison. And first of all, he missed quoted the, the quote, the, the statement is inmates running the asylum. But then when he went on to clarify that, he really, w he, he clarified it by saying he was referring to the 
the league doing things and making moves without full input and buy-in from the owners. So you can kind of see that there was something there, and this is a couple, three weeks ago. Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a there's a feeling that maybe the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, and. Uh, when you're talking about the type of money that we're talking about, the television contracts that they that, that are at stake here, uh, and just the millions, the billions of dollars that are that are you know, involved in these franchises, I think the that all the owners want to get together with Goodell and maybe get themselves more on the same page because what you worry about is obviously some kind of labor dispute. You know, we, we it's been a while since we had one of those. Thank goodness, none of us want to see another one of those and. Let's be honest. The, the NFL has lost a little bit of luster here you know, this season with, you know, with the with all the craziness with the anthem uh, demonstrations and things like that. I know I know more than than one pretty solid NFL fan who has told me I'm done with the NFL. I will not watch an NFL game. I won't let my kids turn on the NFL in my house this season. No, and and, and to me it comes down to a risk reward question. That whole thing. Uh, the, the players that kneel, some of the things that come out, they're, 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 they are taking a risk in, in making these statements. And, and I'm struggling with the reward they're getting. You know, Kaepernick came out, it's been well over a year now that he was protesting the social injustice. And literally, to my knowledge, nothing's been done outside of the grandstanding, is what I'll call it, of doing the kneeling. Let's get out and do some things. I'm all for that, but that hasn't been done. And, and even in this latest iteration, um, still, it's just all about, hey, we have the right to protest, and we're going to protest despite what uh, what the negative fallout might be. Yeah, I think, you know, in my eyes, what, what I struggle with is, are you doing anything about the problem, or are you just drawing attention to yourself? And, and yes, they have they have the ability to get on TV and do something, but... Are they just drawing attention to themselves instead of really getting out there in the community and working to change the problem? And it's and it's something that, that we struggle with, and certainly we could do two or three shows just on that. Uh, but it is it's it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. We're going to change gears a little bit. I, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk Aggie football, uh, being an Aggie alum as you are and, and a big fan. And so you know the Aggies came into the SEC, and that was a big deal. And there were a number of folks out there that said, oh, the Aggies are going to fall on their face. And they come in and they make a big splash. It's Kevin Sumlin, his, his spread offense, his own read, and then a, a young man by the name of Manziel comes in, sets the world on fire. And by that, I mean he went into Alabama and beat Alabama and had a historic season and won the Heisman. But that is where the Aggies peaked. And I'm an LSU fan. And when the... SEC and a number of the power conferences went to the conference championship format. Your season starts and ends with whether you make that conference championship game. So your season is, can I win the SEC West? And folks, if you know who's in the SEC West, if your name's not Alabama, LSU, or Auburn, you haven't been to Atlanta in the SEC championship, and I can't remember how long. And so the Aggies kind of were slapped with that reality. They had this huge splash season, their second year in the SEC, and they finished third in the SEC West that year, despite the fact they beat Alabama at Alabama, and their quarterback set all these records and won the Heisman. So talk about kind of the Aggies' trials and tribulations here in their entree into the SEC. Yeah, yeah it's a different set of expectations, and, and I'm with you, when I, and I worried as a fan, I, I worried that when they went into the SEC, I didn't want to become the Vanderbilt of the SEC West, and 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 they haven't. Uh, but like you said, did they peak? You know, in 2012, 2013, with the Manziel years, and it's been sort of a downhill slide since then. Uh, you know, the Aggies are a team that, that, as a fan, they break your heart because they tend to start out the season four and 5 and setting the world on fire, get everyone all worked up, ranked in the top ten. And then the month of you know, late October, November tends to roll around, and and things go downhill and go downhill quickly. That's when they get into their SEC West schedule. You get into the conference schedule, and it's it's one thing to beat you know Nickel State at home. It's one thing to to, to beat New Mexico. Uh, it's another thing to go beat teams like you said, like Auburn, LSU, and of course the 800-pound gorilla that is Alabama. Uh, so Sumlin is on the hot seat, and there's yeah, that's my question. Where are you at with that with yeah, Sumlin? I have I have so many friends, and and the hashtag is hashtag fire Sumlin now. 
Okay. Uh, you know, hi, hashtag fire Kevin Sumlin. Uh, I, I, I agree that it's probably time for a change. Um, it, you know, do I think it's fair to Sumlin or not? I don't know. I mean, he's he's had winning teams, but unfortunately, again, when you're the when you're Texas A&M and you're in the SEC, nine and three, eight and four, that is not good enough. That's not going to get it done. Uh, you have to be careful, though, and you know this as an LSU fan. When they ran less miles out of town, you have to be careful because yep. who do you have to bring in that's going to be better? If you've got someone that you've earmarked that's going to be better and bring a new energy to the to the team, fantastic. If if you don't, you got to be careful because if you make the wrong decision, not only are things not going to get better, you might set your, your your club back for a good three, four, five years. Well, that's for a whole new show dedicated to that. What what do you do? in those scenarios, and LSU is certainly in the middle of that. Good stuff, Jason. We want to thank you again for joining us. It's been Absolutely. a lot of fun. Anytime. And we, pre folks, we, pre we thank you for joining us, our H-Town fans and global viewers here on HLTV Sports. All season long, tune in. We're going to have some guests. Next week, we're going to have Spurgeon Wynn. This is a guy is a local product, went to Episcopal High School, Minnesota, and ended up in the NFL and the Cleveland Browns, and he's a, a, a buddy of mine. And he's going to tell us his story, and it's going to be an exciting episode. So we appreciate you joining us. And a thank you again to Twin Peaks, the Twin Peaks girls, and the Rosa Brothers for hosting us here on HLTV Sports. Are you ready?